Okay, so here we go. To those not here in class, we're just going to start working on our packet. But first, we're going to go back and do number 11 from the take home packet. Um, so this one's just a simplification of square root problem. Um, when I get one of these where I have both numbers and variables, first thing I like to do is split those two things up. So I can write this as root 150 times root z to the 101. And so first thing I want to do is simplify that 150. Um, I need to find two factors to split that into. One of those factors I want to be a perfect square so I can simplify it. <clears throat> so I'm going to start with 150 and do a factor tree to figure out what perfect squares are contained in 150. So I'm going to do 10 times 15. Both of these split up. 10 equals 2 times 5. 15 is equal to 5 times 3. Now that they're all prime, I go through and I circle any pairs that I might have. I have exactly one pair of fives. <clears throat> so the factorization of 150 that I want to use is 25 times whatever factors are left. 2 times 3 equals 6. So I'm going to split my 150 up into 25 times 6. So root 25. I know I can simplify that one. And then root 6. Can't simplify that one. Um, as for the z's, I have an odd numbered exponent, which means I can't really simplify this right off the bat. I need to turn this into an even exponent first. Good, exactly. Yeah, so you just break off one single factor of whatever number that is, giving you an even factor, so you can simplify it. Oops, I should do this in red. z to the 100. And then plain old z splits off too. We can't simplify the stuff in black, so it just stays there. I can simplify the stuff in red, so I'm going to do that. The 25 turns into 5. z to the 100, what does that turn into? 10. 10. What? Not quite. Remember, what do we do with even numbers? Oh, we cut it in half. Yeah, cut it in half, remember? So this is z to the 50. And then what's in black here, that stuff can't be simplified anymore, so it just stays where it is under the square root, 6z. Okay, so there we go. Um, and, you know, I was, I was telling somebody earlier, like, there's like 60 to 70% of this test. I'd say like 60% at least is, is just roots and radicals. Yeah, and, and these, are, these are not too bad to study once you get the hang of them. At first, they're confusing, yeah. But once you figure it out, you're like, oh, that's not that bad. Um, I'm just going to go for this. So yeah, th those are not too bad to study. <clears throat> so that was number 11 from the take home. Let's move on to our packet. And maybe I'll just ask you guys before we start, would you rather um, me pause before each problem and give you time to look at it and see if you can solve it? Or would you rather me kind of like charge through and just go for it? I'm getting a little bit of both. I'll do something in between. Then. <laughs> no, I'll, I'll pause for a little bit and give you guys time to work through. So, so on problem number one, you guys that have the packet, go ahead and bust it out and see if you can sort of um, you know, figure out how to do this problem. If you have absolutely no idea, that's okay. That's what we're here to do today. <laughs> so <clears throat> go ahead and take a look at problem number one in this packet and see if you can, you know, figure out how to do that problem type. If you're at a complete loss and you're saying, man, I don't know how to do any of this, make sure you put like a big star or something at the top of your page to indicate you need to study that later. Yeah, just the first one for now. I'm going to go ahead and let the cat out of the bag. This is the first problem on your exam. <laughs> like, I'm not, I'm not even hiding it, right? Like, the numbers are going to change a little bit, but not much. 
It's going to be a y equals mx plus b form even. You know, you don't have to do anything on that. So all you have to do is remember how to graph two equations and then estimate where they cross. Okay, do a rough estimation. As long as it's in the right general area, it's a total success for me. Okay. So I'm just going to start graphing the first equation here. If you're still working, just keep on going. I'm just going to slowly start graphing this first equation. So you guys remember from graphing, y equals mx plus b is the form that we're in. And so the y-intercept is at the point 0b. So for this first equation, I'm going to put my y-intercept at the point 0 plus 1. Also on this first equation, it says that my slope is going to be a negative 1. So that means I need a rise of 1 and a run of 1. But one of those needs to go in the, in the negative direction. Right, so first I'm going to go up. I'll go up one, and then I'm going to go one in the negative direction. That's going to give me a point. And then I'll make my next point by going down one and one in the positive direction. Okay, so that's my first line. <laughs> Something like that. <clears throat> okay, so now I'm just going to graph the second line. It's already in y equals mx plus b form. If it wasn't, I'd want to put it in that form. But, it, but it's already here. So this is telling me that the y-intercept happens at the point 0, positive 2. So I'm just going to zoom in a bit here. Make my first point at 0, positive 2. It also tells me that my slope is a positive 2. So I need to go up 2 and over 1. 1, 2, over 1. And I can find my other point by going down 2 and over 1. Down 1, 2, over 1. Looks more like I have a curve here almost. <laughs> okay, so this is how inexact you're allowed to be, right? <laughs> like, look at this. This is so ugly. This is so ugly. But if I can tell that you have the correct y intercepts and that you've marked out the slope correctly, you know, like. That's why you're giving us grief, but it better not look like. No, no, it's okay. I understand that graphing is not an exact science, and you guys are not computers. You guys are normal people, and, you know, how could I draw my graph like this and then insist that you guys don't? <laughs> I mean, come on. So, you know, you can see how terrible this is, but I'm just going to guess. You know, and as long as I've graphed things correctly, I'll get 100% on this. So, I don't know, that point is at maybe, let's say, one half, comma, one and a half. So maybe... Three halves. There we go. Yeah, as long as you're somewhere in the general area, even if you're off by a couple of points, I don't care. As long as you graphed it correctly, that's the most important part. Okay. <clears throat> and and just for just for S's and G's, what does the graph Y equals two look like? <laughs> but hold on, I'm going to go over one more that's a little weird. So we'd say 1, 2, right? And this is a horizontal line at y equals 2, right? So if you see that as one of your equations, just draw that line. But there's another weird graph that you might see. Sometimes they might say this is one of your graphs, y equals x. And you say, uh, what do I do there? <laughs> yeah, yeah, don't, you know, don't freak out. Uh, it's the same exact um, sort of pattern that the other y equals mx b uses, right? Since there's no b here, b is equal to zero. And my first point goes directly at the origin. I have a one in front of my x, so I count a one slope. Right? This is just a diagonal line through the origin, y equals x. And everywhere along this line, the two points just equal each other. Okay, so those are the weird graphs you might run into. 
Um, it's pretty unlikely, though. So prepare yourselves for question number one on the exam. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> so this one, we're asked to use substitution or elimination to solve this system of equations. Um, this is kind of a little bit of a weird example. Why not? I don't know. Because uh, when you put in 10 minus x next to the y, there's a negative 1, essentially, right? Uh-huh. And then the x becomes a positive x, and then you put that on top of the negative x, and then you have no more x. And so what do you get in the very last line? What does it tell you? Uh, it's negative 10 equals negative 3. Is that ever true? No. No solutions. <laughs> That's it. When you do these things, and it's, it's not that it didn't work. It worked perfectly. It just didn't come out with a single answer. right? So when, you, when you're doing your math by substitution or elimination, don't worry, guys. We'll get into what, what happens here in just a second. If you reach the, the ending line and all your variables cancel out, that means it's either infinite solutions or no solutions. If it's a true statement, it's infinite solutions. If the statement is something weird like this that's never true, it's no solutions. <laughs> yeah, this is an interesting example. So you did yours with substitution, right? Yes, sir. So if you take a look at this, we can see our additive opposites are there. Positive x, negative x. Positive y, negative y. So we add vertically. Everything goes away. And we get 0 equals 7. Right? Yeah, just like, and, and you'll come up with different uh, answers that, that just are not true. Um, but when you do that, and you come up, and everything cancels, and you get a non-true statement, uh, you can just say, no solutions. All right, and then every once in a while, um, let's see now, what else might happen? Um, oh, uh, the other kind of variation on that weird situation is if you had like x plus y equals 10, and then you had like 2x plus 2y equals 20. And then you found out, um, like, like you could just recognize that one of these equations is a multiple of the other. When you have this case, um, you'll end up finding the additive opposites, right? And so like if I multiplied this upper equation by a negative 2, and then I wrote my results below, I'd end up with a negative 2x minus 2y equals negative 20. When I did my vertical addition on this, I end up with 0 equals 0. Yeah, so it's infinite solutions on this one. And it's all about what happens on this last line of the equation. If it's a true statement, infinite. If it's not true, no solutions. <clears throat> OK. Um, <clears throat> yeah. So let's keep going. Uh, oh, I'm supposed to give you guys time to look at these. So go ahead and take a look at this one, guys. <laughs> okay. <laughs> give you, yeah, just a few minutes to kind of recognize whether or not you need to study this problem type. Okay, that's probably enough time to uh, recognize whether you need to study this problem type or not. Um, <clears throat> so if you're looking at this problem type, you might be looking at it saying, um, I don't know, is that a mixture problem or is that a problem where we just kind of create two equations? two equations? Good. This is sort of a two equation. This is a two equation problem, but it, it's more of a, it's kind of like a total value problem because we're dealing with the number of points associated with baskets, right? But there's no percentages. So it's not like a classic mixture problem. 
Okay, so um, I'm, I'm gonna create a table for this. Uh, some people don't create tables for these ones and that's totally fine, it's just whatever is up to you. For the mixture problems, I always recommend creating tables though. Um, so, for this first column we can say total baskets. In the middle column we can say multipliers. In the bottom we can say total points. Right? So on the top, it's the total number of actions. On the very bottom row, it's the total number of points or whatever resulting from those actions. <clears throat> so let's see now. We have two point baskets and three point baskets. So in the first column, we'll put two pointers. Second column, we'll put three pointers. Oops. And then in the end, we'll just put a mix. All right, so I'm going to say the number of two-point baskets I make is x, number of three-point baskets is y, and then, of course, the mix was, let's see now, the total number of baskets scored was 22, so the mix is 22 baskets. <clears throat> okay, the multipliers on this are a little bit different than uh, pure, like, straight mixture problems. Uh, and that's just because we don't have a multiplier for this last column. It's already done for us. The multiplier on the two-point shots, right? We get two points for every shots, so the multiplier is two. It is three for every three-point shot. And since they already give us the total number of points, we don't have a multiplier for this last column. Okay, the total points column, just like always, just like in mixture problems and any other type, we make our entries here by multiplying the two entries above. So two times x gives me two x, three times y gives me three y, and then in my total points column, the mixture of both shots gives me, let's see now, yeah, the total number of points is 55. Okay, so now that I've made my table, the rest should be pretty easy, sort of. You sum across the first row to get your first equation, x plus y equals 22. And then you sum across the bottom row to get your second equation, 2x plus 3y equals 55. <clears throat> um, hmm. Maybe we'll do substitution. You got a question? All right, let's do substitution. So I'm going to substitute, I'm going to solve for x. So um, remember, to do substitution, we solve for a variable, and then we use that and plug it into the other equation. Okay. So I'm going to take this top equation, I'm going to solve for x. If I subtract y from both sides, minus y minus y, I get x equals 22 minus y. Now I take that what x is equal to, and I plug it in for x in this lower equation. Okay, so I should have two times what x is equal to, 22 minus y, plus 3y equals 55. So you can see, all I did was sub in this blue stuff. And now that I put that in, I should only have one variable left. I only have y left. I don't have x and y, so that was that was a good move. That was valid. <clears throat> so now I go ahead and solve this. All right, I need to uh, get rid of all my parentheses. So I distribute. 2 times 22 gives me 44. 2 times negative y gives me negative 2y. And then I have the rest. Now I go ahead and combine like terms. 44 plus y equals 55. And when I subtract 44 from both sides, These guys will cancel, and I end up with y equals 11. <clears throat> yeah, so now that I have one of the variables, I go up and I plug it into one of the above equations to find out what the other variable must be. So I already have x equals 22 minus y. If y is equal to 11, I have 22 minus 11, 
and that just gives me 11. <clears throat> so I have y equals 11, x equals 11. So it turns out that the K-high kings made uh, the same number of three-point and two-point shots, 11 of each, which is pretty good if you're into basketball. All right, number four. <laughs> I'm a little disappointed Kimmy is not here today because <laughs> this is about <laughs> vet stuff. <laughs> All right, so... Um, <clears throat> So, there is a certain veterinary supply center that mixes their own dog chow. They have determined that 60% is the optimum percentage of salmon parts for dog chow. Bin A is 30% pure salmon parts. Bin B is 80% pure salmon parts. How many pounds of each should be mixed to get 200 pounds of the desired 60% salmon mix? <clears throat> Okay, this is definitely a classic mixture problem. We have multipliers for all three, right? So let's set up our table. And remember, I, I've gone over this before, but I'll just go ahead and say it again. It's, it's acceptable to put a blank table on your note card for your exam. That's okay for a mixture problem. Um, and blank meaning you just have kind of the sides filled in, right? And so for this, we're talking about pounds of the salmon mix. So up on the first one, we're going to say, we're going to call that total weight. In the middle column, we put multipliers, just like always. And then in the last column, what do we put in the last column here? Uh, uh, eh? All right, what? Not mix, right? What do we what do we usually put down? No, sorry, not last column, last row. What do we put down here below multipliers for this problem? Right? In the past we've had what is it? Total pounds. Total pounds was up top, oh. right? What results from those pounds? Right? Before we've used pure acid. Total salmon. There you go. Yeah, total amount of salmon. Total parts. <laughs> total salmon parts. <laughs> <Whoa>. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, so now I have my side. Uh, on top, I put my mixtures and then my mix. So I'm going to put bin A right here. That is 30%. Bin B, that is 80%. And then my mix. And we want a 60% on that mix. Okay, <clears throat> so just like I usually do, I'm going to call my total number of pounds of the A mix to be X, my total number of pounds of the B mix to be Y, and then my total poundage of mix says I want 200. Good. All right. Now this is a classic mixture problem, so I, I fill out all the multipliers, right? And when we're dealing with percentages, we convert those to decimals. So 0.3. 0.8 in the second column, and then 0.6 in the third column. So in my multipliers row, right, in my multipliers, I just put uh, how much salmon is in each pound of these, right, the percentage of salmon. So since this first one was 30%, I put a 0.3 for my multiplier. Right? I'm, I just convert percentages into decimals. Oh. <laughs> Wait, well, because it didn't seem like you. Seemed like you. <laughs> All right. So, um, so remember, now we're gonna do the the last uh, entries just like we did the ones before. So I multiply 0.3 by x to get 0.3x. 0.8 by y to get 0.8y. And then here's, here's a key part. We've we got to multiply these last two entries because this is a classic mixture problem. So you sh this should give me 0.6 times 200 should give me 120. So just like with the last problem, I get my first equation by summing across the top row. X plus Y equals 200. All right? 
that equation deals with just the weight of the, of the mix. And then we have the pure salmon. So I have 0.3x plus 0.8y equals 120. So that equation deals with just the salmon parts. That's it. So since this is kind of a classic mixture problem and we have decimals, I usually like to use elimination. Um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, use the y or the x's for elimination. So I'm just going to need to create the additive opposite of this 0.3. So I multiply my other equation up top by a negative 0.3. So when I write my results, I end up with negative 0.3x, just like I wanted, negative 0.3y, and then I have a negative 60. When I do my vertical addition, my x's will cancel, and I'm going to end up with 0.8y minus 0.3y. That's going to give me 0.5y, and that's going to equal 60. And so this tells me that y, right, when I divide both sides by 0.5, it should give me 120. Yeah, y equals 120. So 120 pounds is going to be the y mix. We just need to find out what the x mix is going to be now. We have x plus y equals 200. If y equals 120, then I have x plus 120 equals 200. And if I subtract 120 from both sides, I end up with x equals 80. So we would say 80 and 120. So x is the 30%. So we would say. Um, we would say that we need 80 pounds of mix A and 120 pounds of mix B to get the desired percentage of salmon parts in our overall mix for the puppy chow. So that's a classic mixture problem. Right? If you see that on the exam, the only thing that will be different is what, what we're talking about, right? This time it was pure salmon parts. Next time it might be, you know, hydrochloric acid. Uh, it might be how much money are the, you know, the coffee beans worth or something like that. This, like the name of this changes, but the procedure doesn't really change for a classic mixture problem. It always works the same. Okay. Uh, oh, sorry. I'll, I'll give you an example of that right now. So if you want, um, if you want an example of like what to put on on your note card, yeah. if you want the t <laughs> if you want the template. So on top you will put. Um, let's see now. I guess it will be total something. Total in the middle multiplier and on the bo bottom pure. Pure something, right? I'll just put a little blank right here. Total something and pure something, right? Across the top, we can put A, we can put B, and we can put mix. All right, and so when you come to your mixture problem, you know that if, if you can manage to fill this table out, you just sum across the first row, sum across the bottom row, and then you have your two equations. Okay. Uh, remember, the multiplier was um, multipliers are decimal forms of percentages, right? Um, you know, if you're mixing like. Uh, Coffee that's worth um, six ninety nine a pound. That would be your multiplier. I'm sorry. What was that? Yeah, the totals would be your usual x and y, right? Whatever you want to name the totals. The weight of poppy chow, or the number of liters of hydrochloric acid mix, or something like that. Okay. Moving on. Mm -hmm. 
Oh. So it's kind of like the the pounds of coffee or the two pointers and three pointers. You're just using decimals instead of one. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, the last thing. Sorry, it's written sloppily. It says pure something, right? Either pure acid, pure salmon parts, uh, pure price on coffee. Um, <laughs> Hold on, let me fix this. Pure? <laughs> My writing's bad today. It's a bad day for writing, I can tell. Yeah, no, I'm telling you, today it's worse than usual. You guys can't tell. I have to live with this, I know. <laughs> Okay, so number five. <clears throat> number five is just a basic uh, roots and radicals, right? Um, usually with these, if we can't see a direct route to a solution, we just want to combine them all. Um, but, hmm, yeah, I'm going to combine them all. So <clears throat> there are other ways to do this, but this is sort of like the way that always just works the same. So I'm going to multiply these two things together and put them under the same square root. 18 times 4, that gives me 72. There's not a square root to 72, is there? No. Definitely not. Okay. So I have 72. So I'm not sure what to do with that, um, but I'm going to make a factor tree. I know I need to split this into two different factors. One's going to be a perfect square. The other one is going to be something I can't really simplify, right? So I take my 72 and I put it in a factor tree. 72 is equal to 9 times 8. 9 is equal to 3 times 3. 8 gives us 4 times 2. almost there. The threes drop down, the two is prime so that drops down and the four splits up into two twos. Exactly. So I identify my pairs. I have a pair of threes and a pair of twos. I multiply all that stuff together. The pair of threes give me nine, the pair of twos give me four. I need to multiply those together. So nine times four gives me, uh, what is it? 36? Yeah, 36. 36. And then the only thing I have left is just this 2 hanging out. So it's 36 times 2. Those are the factors that I'm going to use. Go back up to my original. And I put my 36 in front here. And my 2 in back. So now in the next step, I just simplify that 36. It turns into 6. Roots 2. Any questions on that one? Okay. All right. <clears throat> Next. This guy. All right. Um, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. I, I keep forgetting to let you guys do these. Um, <laughs> you guys don't seem to mind, though, that I'm just kind of pushing right ahead. Okay. <laughs> All right, so with this one, you know, um, you could absolutely try and uh, simplify it right off the bat. Um, I like to, I like to extend these out because neither neither twenty seven nor three is a perfect square, so I'm gonna extend the root over the whole thing. If you're doing what? Um. It depends. Um, hmm. Like if you completely skip that step? Well, like if I, if I forget to draw the extended square root, but I still perform that function? Oh. <laughs> um, as long as your answer is in the correct form, I, I, I might let, I'll let you slide on the intermediate steps. But if you lose the square root and then it just goes away, no, that, that, that doesn't fly. Um, yeah. Yeah, that would be fine. Yeah, as long as your answer is, is on point, then your steps get quite a bit of leeway. Okay, so 27 over 3, um, that's equal to 9. So this gives me root 9. And of course, root 9 is just 3. All right, number 7. 
the root of 450. <clears throat> what would you guys do if you ran into this? Factor tree, exactly, right? That's a huge number. Ooh, I can't pick out a perfect square out of that. I'm not that good. So let's just try a factor tree. So we have 450 here. Um, 45 times 10. All right, 45 is equal to 9 times 5. 10 is equal to 2 times 5. 9, that's equal to 3 times 3. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I'll slow down a little bit. And then the five comes down here. Did you beat me? Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right, so now that we're at the bottom, now that everything's prime, I circle my pairs. So I got a pair of threes, and I got a pair of fives. I multiply all that together. So three times three is nine. Five times five is 25. Thank you. 225 is my perfect square factor. The only thing that's left is this little lonely two over here. So now I split up my 450 into these two factors. I have the root of 225 times the root of 2. All right, and then I'm just going to find out what the square root of 225 is. Nice. 15 it is. So we replace the root 225 with 15, and we get 15 roots 2. <laughs> this is tough. <laughs> All right, I'll, I'll give you a little bit more time on these next ones. <laughs> Number eight. You don't need a whole lot of time on this, but we'll go through these and, and see if you can kind of pick out which is which, right? Which of these are perfect squares, if there are any, which are rational, which are irrational? Okay, so you might have taken a look at these <clears throat> and noticed that <laughs> I don't know why the font changes when I do this. It just does. I don't do that on purpose. <laughs> but we have this little 64 up here. Um, is that a perfect square? Yeah. Why? Exactly. Yeah, because because two integers mul or the the integer multiplied together equals that number, right? So yeah, it's a perfect square. Is it rational or irrational? It's right. It's rational because it's an integer. And all integers can be represented as fractions of integers, 64 over 1. OK, what about this one? It is rational, yeah. Why is it a perfect square? Wait a minute. But this isn't equal to 81. This is equal to 9. So be careful. It's 3 times 3 that makes this a perfect square, not 9 times 9. Right? It's, it's not the number underneath here. It's the number the whole thing equals. Oh, right? I'm still right? Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I put that in there specifically to mess with you guys. It's <laughs> yeah, remember, it's, it's not what's underneath the radical. It's what it all equals. Yeah. <laughs> OK. What about this one? Root 12. Yeah, well, let's see now. If we punch this into the calculator, we get something weird. Root 12 gives us 3.4641, blah, 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 blah. So it's definitely not a perfect square, right? Because to be a perfect square, you've got to be an integer in the first place. Is it rational or irrational? Irrational, right? Um, and sort of the, the rule of thumb is when you, you deal with these things, is if you cannot reduce it past the radicals, it's irrational. Right? So I could reduce this a little bit, but I'd always have a radical involved. You know, I could split this up into root 4 times root 3, and then change this into 2 roots 3. 
but because this root three will never simplify out, this is irrational, right? This 81, it equals an integer, and so that one's rational. But if you can't simplify the radical out, it's irrational, okay? This one, the number one, is this a perfect square? Is it rational or irrational? Right, that's almost a gimme. What about this guy? Yeah, irrational. Yeah, it's got a radical in there. We can't simplify that radical out, right? So it must be irrational. Okay. So if you're not sure and you're on an exam, uh, whether something's rational or irrational, something you can do, like, you know, if I just have um, the root of 55, and you're like, I don't know, I don't, I don't want to simplify that, just type it in. Well, let's see now, what is the square root of 55? Oh, it's not an integer, so it's irrational. Like, that's all you got to do is just check it on your calculator. If it doesn't turn out to be an even integer, it's, it's irrational, it must be. Whereas if you plug in the root of 25, you're going to get a 5 out, which means it's rational. Okay, I think I've talked about that one enough. <laughs> Here we go. Suppose you're asked to simplify this. Um, so remember, when we deal with roots and radicals, they're never fully simplified until we've rationalized the denominator, meaning you don't have any more radical signs in the denominator. Good question? Okay. <laughs> um, to rationalize the denominator, all you do is you multiply top and bottom. Don't forget that part. You got to do top and bottom of the fraction by the radical part of the denominator. <laughs> Darn it. <laughs> we'll assume that you guys would have just nailed that one. Is it five times square roots two over six? Yes. <laughs> All right. So after we multiply top and bottom by the radical part of the denominator, um, we just combine it, right? So we have 5 roots 2 over 3 times root 2 times root 2. That just equals 2. And so this gives us 5 roots 2 over 6. Okay, now that there's no more radical in the denominator, this is considered simplified. Okay x to the 13th. I will give you guys a couple seconds to do this one. <laughs> Just a couple seconds. Okay, so you guys may have noticed this is an odd number up here on the exponent, which means there's a very specific procedure that we always go through. We split off exactly one factor, and then we simplify what's left with the even-numbered exponent. So with this, I rewrite it as x to the 12th times my single x that I split off. I know that my x to the 12th can be simplified and remember how we rewrite this. I'm not going to, you guys don't have to do this on, on the exam, but just so you don't lose the concept here, I can rewrite this in terms of squares. Right? x to the 6th squared times root x. And remember, when you write something in terms of squares under a square root, that exact thing pops out the other side. So x to the 6th pops out. So this equals x to the 6th times root x. Right? And just notice that the 6 up here is exactly half of this 12, right? So that's how you handle an odd exponent. And remember, if I give you something with an even exponent, just cut it in half. If I have z to the, let's say, let's say it's 1,000. Right? This is just equal to z to the 500 any even number, you just split it in half when you simplify it. 
But remember, that's with the exponent, <laughs> not with the actual base. Okay, so number 11, it's another glorious one. I'll give you guys a couple of minutes to take a look at this. All right, we did something similar to this at the beginning of class. All right, how do we handle this if we see it in an exam? Do we cry, maybe? Yeah. Oh, we can make an <laughs> yeah. Uh, 4x squared t cubed times square root 13. Probably. <laughs> I, your, your variables are correct. I can't do the numbers in my head, though. Um, but, but your variables are correct. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to erase this sad face. We don't like that. We like, we like happy faces. What's that? I like that face. This isn't, Brian's happy face is a little more, like, a little more crazed, though. And Brian's like. We had a conversation earlier about me freaking out and trying to learn math with my spouse last night. Yeah. Oh, okay. And so, like, geez, Noel, you really know what you're doing. You're an expert at math. No, it doesn't work if you guys laugh when I do it. <laughs> she needs like like positive affirmations, like you guys like going, oh, ah. <laughs> I would say that you're an expert at math and you should never do housework again. Everybody should take care of that for you. <laughs> okay, so, <laughs> so with this one, I'm going to erase Brian's creepy smile up here. Just kidding. <laughs> Brian is so good at that. All right, let's get rid of that. <clears throat> okay, so uh, we're going to split this up into numbers and variables. So I have 208 times the root of x to the fourth times the root of t to the seventh. So the root of 208, I'm not sure what that's going to split up into, so I'm going to do one of my little factor trees over on the side here. So I have 208. Um, I don't know, what do I split that up into? 8 and 26. Good choices. 8 and 26. 8 splits up into 2 and 4. 26 splits up into 13 and 2. Uh, so then the 2 drops down, the 4 splits up into a pair of 2s. I have my 2 drop down and my 13 drop down. So I circle a pair of 2s here and a pair of 2s there. In the end, when I multiply all those pairs together, I get 16 and it's times 13. Okay, so I know what to split my 208 up into. So I'm going to split it up into the root of 16 times the root of 13. Okay. Um, and my x to the fourth, I'm going to rewrite that in terms of squares. Right, this is a step that if you don't complete this step, I'm not going to ding you for it. Just remember that, that 4 needs to split in half. And then with the t, I have an odd number of exponents, so I need to split one off. So I rewrite this as t to the 6th times plain old t. OK. <clears throat> Maybe I should rewrite this in red just so I can say there we go. So all the stuff in red is going to simplify. All right, I'm going to write it out front. So the root 16, that turns into a 4. The square root of x squared squared, that turns into x squared. The root of t to the 6th, that turns into t to the 3rd. And then all this stuff here in black, the root 13 and the root t, 
that's what I have hanging out here, 13T. Okay, so there we are. Any questions? <laughs> no. <laughs> so were there any problems in particular that you guys found yourselves kind of struggling on or thinking like, well, that was crazy? Um, Ah, the mixture yeah, table, huh? I, I keep relating it back to the other almost like with the sequence. Right. Yeah, that's that's a good point. Yeah. So there's um it's kind of like there are three types of problems that we really deal with with these in, in these dual equation problems. Um one is like two equations. Right. Um that's usually stuff like um complementary angles in a triangle, right? And say two, uh, two equations add to 90 degrees, and one is 40 degrees uh, more than the other, right? The second type would be like a total value problem, right? Which is kind of like a mix. It's kind of like a mix, right? But it's like the points, the basketball points. When it's not quite mixture, um, but you have like a total value of points or something like that. And then the third is like the, the classic mixture. Um, and I do I do examples for all the classic mixture problems um, on those videos and I can also if you want to come in on Friday and study um, we can come up with extra junk with the with the, with the mixture problems um, by the way I don't know if you guys have uh, heard but Noel is gonna just come in Friday to just do some studying I'm available pretty much all this Friday Thursday is kind of like my busy day but Friday is pretty chill I usually like leave before five, but I'm here in the morning and the afternoon. Question. This Friday? Yes. Yeah, we can figure that out. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, we, we could definitely arrange something for that. Um, what's your schedule like on that Friday? Uh, actually, I was supposed to work, but since it's my last actual day, um, it can, I am going to try to schedule something for that. Okay, and so I'll probably just have you schedule an appointment down at the testing center and go in any time Friday and take it. Yeah, and then just do it to, at your convenience. Yeah, okay. Yeah, and just uh, maybe remind me of that yeah. <laughs> on Thursday so I don't forget. I'm like, final? What final? Uh, okay, cool. Um, so that's about it for today. Just um, that's that's it. Any questions before the exam? <laughs> okay. Um, I'm going to come in a class tomorrow and not know any of this. Are you sure? Because we just went over it. <laughs> Does everybody feel that way? Almost. Get going. And that'll be great after that. So, so let me tell you my strategy for kind of like the last minute thing. Um, <clears throat> you know, if there's stuff that you guys know a little bit, but not all the way, kind of like you're familiar with it, it seems like it's sort of easy, you're just not getting it, study that stuff, because that's gonna what's going to come to you the quickest. The stuff that you have no idea about, it, it's really, no, don't give up, that's really complicated, like leave that for last. Right, like lock in the stuff that's going to give you points first. Oh, yeah. Right, you know what the first problem is going to be. It's going to be that graphing equation. Right, the two graphs. Do like five examples of that. Right, just so you know exactly how to do that, and it's you lock in those points right there. You know there's going to be a system of equations problem. Right, do a few do a few repetitions. Lock that in. One of these goofy things. Right, it doesn't take it, it, these ones. You probably have to study less than most. Right? But, but the things that, that um, you know, are, are kind of quick problems, you know, try and study those fa uh, first and, and get, a, you know, get those points kind of under your belt and then maybe move on to mixture problems that are a little bit more difficult. Um, that's just a strategy. Most people would say, no, study at all, but you, know, you want to get good grades. <laughs> that was my strategy. Yeah, so there we are. <laughs>